Hello and welcome to VMware Speaker Series. It's an annual EMEA event in which we are meeting you with lots of exciting individuals that have crossed multiple boundaries and have challenged themselves. We are currently today with Maxim and Stefan Ivanovi. I'm your kind host, Evelyn, and I'm working at R&D team at VMware. The speaker series is addressing lots of different issues in terms of innovation, but this year is the year of resiliency. We have struggled a lot. Our world has seen great challenges. And I believe that the speakers today would be able to speak a little bit more about their individual experiences and how they overcome themselves, how they are striving to achieve better versions of themselves and how they are really resilient and have lots of grit in them. So let's welcome Maxim and Stefan Ivanovi. Thank you very much. Very happy to be with you today. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. So, for the people that are not so aware of what is your real achievement so far, can you please elaborate a little bit more about your crossing of Atlantic Ocean into the season of storms and all the great things that happened to you? Certainly. Well, for us, this was an adventure which is completely outside of our comfort zone. Uh, I'm a banker. I've been working at the big banks around the world for the last 25 years, and Maxim is a high school student. So we had absolutely nothing to do with rowing, with uh, boat building, uh, with navigating in the ocean. And for, for us, everything was new. Yeah, yeah indeed. And so uh, what was the challenge that you really decided to accept? How it started and what was the real challenge? Well, um, I'd say that the, uh, the idea wasn't like, didn't come up very grandly. It was actually uh, one night, I jokingly said that my father would end up rowing across the Atlantic one day. And I said it because before that he had swam across um, um, the English Channel, he had gone on countless of ultra marathons. So I thought he would be able to do this. But I said it thinking that it was something completely impossible. Uh, and that same night, we actually Googled it and saw that people had actually crossed oceans before with ocean rowing boats. So that was actually the night where we thought maybe this is something that we could actually do. Oh, yeah, indeed. And you've actually been uh, on that boat for how long? Well, it took us 105 days at sea. Uh, originally, we planned for a much shorter trip. Yeah. Uh, we were thinking of uh, maybe doing it in 60 days, maybe 40 days. Uh, and a lot of unpredictable things came up. Yeah. Yeah. Was uh, this travel um, in some way supported by a particular organization, or it was uh, completely a self-funded decision no, yeah, of yours? It was, it was self-funded. Uh, we Actually, most ocean rowing boats uh, do have many sponsors. They're plastered with all kinds of stickers uh, of their sponsors, and we didn't have any um, because we actually didn't know if we were going to be able to cross that ocean uh, that summer. So we felt very uncomfortable looking for sponsors and telling them that maybe this won't be able to happen um, even a month before the actual crossing. Um, but it was, it was self-funded, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And traveling an ocean, that is, that is a big thing. I believe it was more than 4,000 uh, sea miles, right? Yes, 4,444 nautical miles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the boat that you were building something that you um, really um, did, did all by yourself? or? Yeah, we decided to build the boat ourselves for several reasons. First of all, we wanted to, to know it very well. So if it breaks uh, in the ocean, uh, we'll, it will be easily able to fix it. Uh, and uh, also we thought that uh, if we were to build it in our garage, we would spend a lot of time together, which for a father yes. of a teenager is a real blessing to be able to spend literally yeah. thousands of hours in the garage building the boat, learning how to do it, learning how to use different uh, tools and uh, also seeing that you can build something from scratch, from a completely uh, empty table, come up with step-by-step uh, step, uh, the, the, the mold, uh, the how, the, the, the appliances, the navigation equipment, communication equipment. It was like two boys playing in the garage uh, and putting together a device that uh, is able to sustain uh, the, um, the um, the blows of the, the, blows uh, of the, of the ocean, ocean right? yeah, yeah. And so this is uh, the actual process that you can see on the screen. Um, it is, uh, it was very hard because we had zero experience, as my father said, in boat building. Uh, so we had uh, contacted Stojan Vojvodov, which you could have s seen in a couple of the photos. And he, he was a neighbor of ours, and he helped, a lot, helped us out a lot. He showed us how to laminate, how to use epoxy resin, 
uh, how to use fiberglass. Uh, the designs actually were uh, given to us by an English designer who designs probably around 80 to maybe 85 percent of these type of boats, ocean rowing boats, Phil Morrison. So we had proper designs from uh, experienced people. We had an experienced boat builder who showed us how to uh, actually manufacture this kind of boat. But we ourselves um, built it. Uh, we didn't really have any external help in terms of actually building um, and constructing the boat. Um, only for the electrical system, we needed a little bit of help. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, by actually a friend of my father's. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, you are having a boat now, so let's imagine you've already built the boat. But were you professional um, people that um, row or no, swim no. or...? No, so actually uh, the, the process of building the boat took a year, a little bit over a year. And while we were building the boat, we had to uh, physically prepare mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, as you said, like, we had to learn how to, how to row from, the, from scratch, from, from the bottom. And uh, actually, Victoria Dimitrova... Um, we, were learn we were trying to learn from the yeah. best. So we were looking for a coach to teach us how to yeah. properly row. Because if you're not using the, the oars properly, over thousands and thousands of <laughs> repetitions, actually more than a million oars chokes we took uh, during the crossing, uh, you're gon going to basically dam damage your body or, or not be able to row after a while. Uh, so she meticulously showed us every move, how to row properly, and we were doing it, uh, it seemed, forever. The system actually of uh, rowing through an ocean, most people that successfully do it, is the following. You row for two hours, mm -hmm. you rest for two hours, you row for two hours, you rest for two hours, and you take turns. Now, try to remember the last time you were in the gym for two hours, right? Uh, and imagine that you had to do it again after two hours. And then there's a night shift from midnight till two. Then there's another at 4 a.m. Then another one at 8 a.m. And this goes on for weeks and months. Uh, we, we thought we were not going to be able to sustain uh, this, this uh, continuous uh, to toil. But it turns out that the human body adapts. I was surprised uh, that after several weeks, uh, it felt like perpetuum mobile. It felt like you could uh, potentially keep going forever. Yeah, yeah it, it, I'd say that uh, getting used to that regime was, was very tough. Victoria actually, she actually increased the difficulty of our training sessions as we progressed. Uh, so at the very beginning, uh, we only had 45 minute training sessions. And then they became like more and more and more, two hours, two hours and a half, three hours. And at the very end, I'd say about a month before uh, we started our crossing and set off, uh, we had these, these um, triple training sessions, which she called, which were exactly what my father described. Uh, on the rowing machine, you row for two hours, then you rest for two hours, then you row for two hours, then you rest for two hours, and you row two hours. So in total, you row six hours. Um, and I remember one day, um, I think I had a night out, and I was a bit irresponsible, <laughs> and I woke up at around 11.30, 12-ish, and um, I thought, oh my god, I have to do 10 hours worth of, worth of like training, so I had to row until like 10 o'clock at night. And uh, the entire training session took my entire day. So then I had to learn how to properly organize myself and uh, be more responsible. Uh, but that's the sort of like level of uh, our training sessions before we set off. So Victoria Dimitrova did a fabulous job of uh, preparing us physically. And to some degree, preparing you physically also prepares you mentally because it's very straining on the mind to continue pushing and continue rowing and continue uh, with her training sessions, if you, even if you don't feel like it, you have to continue on and doing it because uh, in the end, you're doing it for yourself. And that's the reason why you have to continue pushing because it's the, you're the person who's benefiting from it. Yeah, so let yeah. me get this straight. This is 105 days where you've been restlessly without sleep, rowing for two hours, sleeping or doing some maintenance on the boat for two hours. Is yeah, you do a little bit of intermittent sleep. Maybe you sleep for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, maximum an hour and a half, because after you finish your shift, you have to undress, look at the weather forecast, maybe eat something. And over the course of 24 hours, you normally sleep about five hours. And again, it's Im impressive how the human body adapts to this. Uh, you know, people have hunted animals. Uh, there are a lot of stronger animals and faster animals, but there's no more enduring animal, mammal at least, uh, than, yeah. uh, than the human, yeah. Were you taking some superfoods to support your 
um, kind of a high intensity. This is really high yes, intensity. Yes, it is very high intensity. On the boat itself, we had a lot of nuts, a lot of oat bars, um, protein bars, uh, energy bars. <laughs> but our, our main like source of food um, were the freeze-dried food. So it's like kind of like uh, astronaut food, if you've seen it. It's mm -hmm. uh, powdered and frozen and dried. And uh, what you do is you open the pack you pour in some water, um, preferably if it, warm water, because then it actually is done, the meal is ready in like 10 minutes. Whereas if you put in cold water, it'd be done in maybe 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, but actually those meals, I remember when we set off, uh, maybe the first month or so, I absolutely hated them, they're horrible. I remember actually throwing up a couple of times from the food. I just really hated them, but um, as, as my father said, uh, when you get used to everything, not only the rowing, but the food itself, uh, you actually start loving the process. And I remember, I'd say maybe the last uh, 40 days of the row, I actually looked forward to eating the uh, freeze-dried uh, freeze food. Um, and it was actually the highlight of my day. I remember rowing, 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 and it's 12 o'clock at night, and I'm thinking, oh, I really like some spaghetti right now. And it, that's all I was thinking about. And so I saw how something which wouldn't really like um, at the beginning. Once you get to know it better, once you get used to it, you start enjoying it. Yeah. And although we were eating after every shift, uh, six times a day, uh, we were losing weight uh, because we could only eat maybe 3,000, 3,500 calories a day and we were consuming potentially uh, more than 5,000. So this caloric deficit resulted in us shrinking <laughs> yeah. our body mass over time. I lost 10 kilos and Max lost 14 kilos during the, the crossing. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> going a little bit backwards before uh, hitting the road, so to say, w were there people that were against this idea or not supporting you in your way of thinking, I should cross the Atlantic Ocean? Well, we were hearing all sorts of comments like, well, they're going to their death, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's no way this can be done for a lot of objective reasons. They cannot carry enough water, they cannot carry enough food and whatnot. Uh, some friends even were trying to convince my wife not to let uh, me take Max with her, maybe hire a lawyer. Uh, and uh, a lot of disbelief, a lot of uh, people basically trying to, to persuade us not to do it. Uh, but uh, there was enough information out there to, to be able uh, for us to, to piece the pieces together and uh, get on the boat, whatever was necessary uh, for the crossing. Yeah. Uh, we thought that it was possible. Uh, actually, two thirds of um, the uh, attempts of rowing across an ocean are, are successful. About one third fail one way or another. And we were trying to avoid those pitfalls uh, that people were, were going for. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of pitfalls, what kind of challenges you had? Apart from the mental challenge, I should do something really crazy that not so many people are really trying to achieve. But um, were you facing challenges while you were on the water? Yes, actually, um, actually before, before the water, before we set off, um, we had a huge challenge come up. It was actually our boat, our boat design. Um, because we're not perfect boat builders, what happened was we actually tested our boat to see if it could self-write. And what self-write means is these, actually, these ocean rowing boats have to be able to flip the other way around once they're completely flipped over. So, for example, if a big wave flips our boat over completely, then it has to be able to turn around by itself. And so we tested that in Greece uh, with a crane and flipped our boat, but it, it was still, um, and it did, not, it, it, it did not turn back around, which is very bad because um, these boats have to be able to do it. It's just something that's necessary, and without it, it's a huge danger for us um, uh, as rowers. So we had to completely deconstruct a large part of the boat, and that took another maybe three or four months of, of building. Uh, so that was a huge, uh, j I guess, challenge that we faced. And it was, it was tough because you thought that you're done with the process, finally the boat's over, uh, the boat building's over, and you don't have to uh, have any prickly um, fiberglass in your clothes because the fiberglass went ev absolutely everywhere in your socks and it was just horrible. Um, but uh, again, you have to, I guess, uh, bite down and uh, continue pushing and uh, fix the boat. And, and once yeah. we hit the water, uh, immediately we started facing challenges because uh, we had not practiced enough uh, on water. Because of the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, we had uh, trained mostly uh, indoors on an erg, on a rowing machine. Uh, we had done one day on the Black Sea, another day on the Aegean Sea, another two days on the Aegean Sea around Tassos Island, but very few days, uh, literally counting on the fingers of one hand. So when we got into the real ocean, 
and when the, the, the uh, waves started getting bigger and bigger and the, the wind started getting stronger and stronger, we didn't know how to maneuver the boat. We didn't know how bad it was going to get. Uh, we didn't know how to, to manage uh, uh, this one ton, one ton boat in the middle of those waves. And it was getting progressively more and more challenging. And then at night, you couldn't even see where the uh, waves are coming from. Uh, and uh, uh, when you're not seeing, it's like trying to cross a highway with your eyes closed, uh, hoping that you're not going to get run over by a truck. So over time, <laughs> we started sensing somehow the, 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 the wind. And normally the waves come with the wind, not always. So we're trying to position the boat at night along the waves, along the, the, the direction of the wind. And uh, little by little, we got, uh, we got used to it. Unfortunately, the, winds, the waves are not constant. Let's say the waves are two and a half meters on average, which means that every two, few minutes you get waves which are twice the average. And every few hours you get waves which are three times the average. So you, you can always be surprised no matter how careful you are, especially if you're not seeing where the waves are coming from. And this was a, a big challenge <laughs> to yeah. begin with. It was, and um, actually the, uh, I guess the fear side of uh, the, the, the big waves was actually, the, as you said, the very first days maybe seventh, eighth or ninth day, I remember that uh, it was very dark and actually the wind had picked up. It was, I think, around 22 to maybe 25 knots, and uh, which was pretty strong wind for our boat. And uh, big waves started coming in. So when you row in the dark, um, it is just, <laughs> it, it's very scary because you don't know where the waves are going to come from. I remember once I was rowing and out of nowhere, this wave just hit me and threw me out of my seat and I hit the side of the boat. Um, almost falling off, um, and that was that was very scary. But I knew that I couldn't really do anything about it. I had to continue on pushing and rowing. Uh, it, I, I, I decided to keep on rowing because it only happened once that night. So I decided that the risk wasn't uh, too big to continue on rowing. Um, but because I have to be careful with that. If the waves get too big, then we have to strap in, uh, get into the cabin, and deploy a sea anchor. Uh, which actually stabilizes the boat against the waves. And then we're safe, then we're completely safe. Um, but while you're rowing, you're definitely vulnerable um, to the elements. And it's very terrifying. And uh, actually, after that night, the wind continued on blowing. So as the wind continues on blowing for long periods of time, larger waves come. So that day, uh, I remember we saw probably the biggest waves we've ever seen and ever saw on this row, which reached probably around eight or nine meters. Yes, and they were very terrifying. Uh, uh, yeah, I remember like tell, telling my dad, I think that the waves are too big. Can I deploy the anchor? And he says, no, no, Max, don't worry, continue rowing. And then he opens the hatch and goes out and says, oh my God, okay, sure, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that, that moment was, was pretty fun. And I remember it, after deploying the anchor, I just a huge sense of relief because the pressure increases as you continue rowing and rowing and, and anticipating a huge hit by a wave and there's like huge waves crashing probably um, crashing and probably as large the crashes of the of the waves were probably larger than the boat so it would have completely submerged the boat if it hit us um, and it was terrifying but after deploying the anchor I felt you know completely free and uh, and safe, and safe, so yes. relieved, yeah. and relieved, yeah. In those conditions, what's suffering also is the equipment. We, we had brand new equipment, all sorts of brands which were meant to, to last in the sea. And we started having equipment failures all over. We had our solar, solar panels uh, corrode completely to the extent that three of the four panels, solar panels were not feeding anymore the batteries. So after several days of uh, mishaps with the solar panels, we had no electricity almost on board, which means that um, we couldn't use all the equipment. We couldn't use the, the water maker, the desalinator, which is this machine which filters the uh, seawater and makes it potable. So we had to use a manual desalinator, which actually you, you apply an arm, a metallic arm that you push with your arm to, to, to create the pressure necessary for filtering the water and cleaning it, uh, which was another one and a half to two hours of uh, Pulling the, yeah. the, the lever yeah. so, so <laughs> on top of the rowing. On top of, yeah, on top of 12 hours of rowing per person, we had to, each had to do around an hour and a half of, of just mowing, the, uh, pull, pushing the, the machine. And, and it's very tough, but I remember, I guess, a coping mechanism. Uh, jokingly, I guess, uh, what, what I did was I, I said that 
Um, I would continue on pushing because after I'm done with the row, because I'd practiced this motion so much, I'll, I'll destroy all my classmates <laughs> in arm wrestling. Yeah, <laughs> and it's just a way that to like positively, I guess, overcome this, this barrier and, uh, and, and make it fun, make it fun, make it interesting and make something that uh, is, um, I guess, genuinely tough. Um, uh, more interesting, more fun, shine a bright light on it. And so we had, we joked around constantly. We were very positive, positive all, all, all the time. I, I don't know if we've had many um, super down moments. I think that that positivity is something that kept us going. I'm yeah. surprised that we didn't have an argument, a real quarrel, a real fight. Uh, is, it was we a, had not, no, yeah, zero yeah. fights, yeah. H hundred days with a teenager and hundred days with your dad yeah. on top of your head, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, amazing. We are live today. Uh, unfortunately, as any live show, uh, my battery died, so I uh, would be very grateful to my assistants if, if they can also pass me forward some of the questions that come from the audience. But let's continue a little bit more around, um, was it exotic as you expected to be? Because maybe you've pictured the ocean, you had some idea of what this experience would look like, but was it really the reality that you originally had? Well, again, we had never been in the ocean, really, so it was very exotic to us. The animals were very exotic. Uh, naturally, we were seeing sharks, we were seeing orcas. Uh, orcas are actually Max's favorite. Yes. <laughs> so we, yeah. we saw a, a school of 30 or 40 orcas, and Max has started chasing them to see them from a close uh, distance. Uh, and uh, I, I thought this was very dangerous, but uh, uh, he was saying that there was no um, accident or no... Uh, occasion when a person uh, has been uh, a human has been eaten by an orca. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was I was I was rowing as per usual, and then I saw um, the fins of of uh, some animals, and uh, I saw many, maybe like four, five, ten, and then I thought immediately thought like, oh, those are dolphins because we had seen many uh, pods of dolphins before, and uh, I I just told my dad, he turned around, opened the hatch as I was rowing, and said, Dad. Uh, there is a couple of dolphins. If you want, you can come out and um, l uh, film them. But if you don't want to, that's fine, because we already had a lot of fo footage of dolphins. So he, he, I guess, slowly started taking out the camera and, and getting ready to take a picture. And then I just kept on looking at them, and they came closer and closer. And so I, I saw that they, they were very black and matte black. Uh, and, and then I realized, okay, that shape, the shape of the fin was not usual. And then one, one orca just jumped out of the water. And I thought, oh my God, I turned around, come on, come on, come on, film, film immediately, immediately. And he started like uh, taking out the camera, panicking. Um, and, and that moment was very fun. And, and then I, as, as he said, I turned around the boat and started rowing towards them because I had read that um, there have been zero, um, I guess, deaths or cases of deaths of, of humans in orcas uh, in the wild. So actually there, there have been a couple of, of deaths in uh, closed um, environments. So for example, some um, aquariums where, where people have been attacked by, by orcas. Um, but in the wild, I don't think there's any deaths. Um, however, after the row, uh, we checked and it turns out that I think that same year, um, more than 20 boats were attacked by orcas. No, 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 no people that were killed, but the boats actually sunk. So maybe that wasn't a very good idea. However, I thought that we were safe. You should yeah. have checked the second Google page, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's really cool. Um, tell me a little bit about, um, were you actually supported by another boat traveling with you or somebody that is close to you? You know, when even in, on IndyCar, they have another big truck driving behind the vehicle if something goes wrong. Well, we didn't have an accompanying vessel, but we had uh, a, a team on, on land. And uh, it was a family project, right? So we had uh, my wife, Jenny, uh, Max's mom, who was coordinating the team. Uh, she was... Uh, uh, speaking with the media, she was sending us food. Uh, at one point when we ran out of food, she managed to find a boat out of French Guinea to send uh, with extra uh, supplies to us. Uh, we had two navigators uh, who were watching the forecast and uh, steering us uh, to try to, s to get away from the storms. Uh, one of them a Bulgarian captain, uh, Valery Petrov, another one, the most experienced ocean rower in the world, uh, Ralph Tuin, a Dutchman who had uh, 
more than 40,000 nautical miles behind his back. So they were uh, helping us. My doctor, my, my brother, uh, was yeah. the doctor of the expedition who was uh, helping us heal all the body aches and the yeah. damage <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the row. And uh, this was very helpful because we were not alone. We were in communication with them uh, through satellite phone, uh, through email. Uh, we were actually getting a lot of uh, uh, messages of uh, good luck and uh, support from people that we didn't know, which was charging us with, uh, with nuclear fuel, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> to yeah. keep on going. Yeah. You've mentioned storms. For, for what I understood, you have a, a few of those, right? Yes. Yeah. What, what was it to be really in the open sea and have a, a storm yes. around you? Yeah, well, uh, we did encounter many storms and, and one hurricane, uh, Hurricane Teddy. Uh, and uh, actually, the, we first encountered the storm before the hurricane. So the storms, um, they were, we had contacted many ocean rowers and they had thoroughly explained what it's like what the process is. So what happens is you put down your, um, your uh, anchor, your sea anchor, which again levels the boat against the wind and against the waves. Uh, and then you pretty much just sit inside and wait. There's, yeah, and hope that, that it passes soon. Uh, and the, it, it sounds pretty easy, but it's, it's actually not very pleasant because our boat actually um, got very, very hot, very humid. And, then, and very smelly, very quickly. So I'd say every two hours, we were forced to open the hatch and let some air in. But that was, again, there's a little bit in risk, a little bit of risk there because the, the boat was bombarded by huge waves. So if we had opened the hatch widely and for a long period of time, we risked water flooding in, which is very bad. Uh, so we had to take a little bit of risk there. And it was just, um, very tough, again, because you just sit there and wait and wait and hope that it passes. The boat is just shaking, shaking constantly, um, and uh, you feel powerless, um, I guess, against the ocean. Um, and it's very tough, but um, it was also a time where you could rest. For example, again, we were very positive, so instead of only looking at the negatives, we thought, okay, well, this is a time where we can sleep, right? We can rest. Um, we can take our time and then get ready for after the after the storm passes, continue rowing. So there's always positives, um, I'd say, in, in in the grand scheme of things, and especially in these these um, storms. We were expecting to have storms because uh, we were uh, rowing in the summer, and the summer is the uh, ho the hurricane season in the Atlantic. So actually, there's no other ocean rowing boat which has crossed the Atlantic uh, during the hurricane season and it was on this route, on this route and it was uh, very normal to expect uh, those tropical storms uh, and those hurricanes and we knew that the boat was strong we had built it maybe a bit a bit too much too a bit yeah. too heavy a bit too tough yeah. it was maybe 200 kilograms extra weight from all the extra epoxy resin and all the, the steel plates and everything so we were confident that the boat was not going to sink maybe it was going to get damaged uh, maybe we needed to ask for help but uh, not before the uh, the storms uh, potentially after our navigator that i mentioned that Ralph Tuen, was uh, persuading us to send us uh, a ship to rescue us before uh, four storms were supposed to hit us one after the other and we thought if necessary we could ask for help after but not uh, before after the storm, <laughs> yeah. 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 yes and so uh, and then, then after the storms came the hurricane and so I actually wasn't too bothered with the storms simply because again the ocean rowers a lot of ocean rowers have experience with tropical storms but very very few have experience with hurricanes and of those who have experience with hurricanes a large percentage of them, maybe 50%, have huge, after the hurricane, have huge damages on their boat and they're not able to continue on their row. So when we, when we had to face the hurricane, that's when I was very scared, uh, simply because boats like these don't have much experience um, uh, against a hurricane. And uh, that, that was very tough. But again, we did the same protocol, same thing. Um, to be fair, it, it, it lasted as long as the other storms, I think. Um, but yeah, right. around two or three days, but it, it, it was a bit more terrifying simply because of the unknown factor of whether our boat would be able to um, hold on and, and, and be, be strong enough to survive this, this hurricane. Actually, this taught us a lesson that uh, no matter how strong the, the, the storm is, it passes. 
the hurricanes pass, uh, all those uh, economic downturns pass, uh, the wars, unfortunately, no matter how, how terrible they are, they also, there's an end to everything. So the sun shines after a while. So there's always a positive lining at the end of the storm. Yes, yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And are you a man of religion? Are you really religious? Have you met God? Let's go to the question. <laughs> um, I think that every person maybe has met a sort of God for his own God, yeah, his own perception. I think every person has his own perception of that. Um, I think I've, I, I wouldn't say that I uh, follow any specific religion, but I do have my beliefs in something. Um, and uh, I think that we here as people should enjoy our time on, on earth, yeah, and uh, do the best of, of our time here, yeah. What kind of exotic creatures? I have to ask this question. What kind of exotic creatures, apart from dolphins and orcas, you you encountered? Was it really noisy and uh, filled <laughs> with fishes around you, or really uh, not at all? Well, uh, we had a whole ecosystem around the boat because at night the light of the boat would attract the flying fish, and the flying fish would uh, hit the boat and fall in the water. And this is when the mahi mahis, which are about a meter, uh, would come and eat them up. And then the the sailfish or the Marlins would come and eat the mahi mahis, and then the, the, the sharks would come. So there were yeah. fish all over <laughs> for probably half of the crossing. Probably and more, than, more than like 40 or 50 fish around the boat for most of the crossing. Yeah. So we caught uh, a dozen of those huge mahi mahis and we ate them uh, raw or, or boiled as, uh, as uh, fish mm -hmm. soup on, on deck. Uh, uh, the most scary, I guess, were the marlins. Uh, they were more than two meters, three meters, uh, meters long. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. if you look from the side of the boat, they look as wide as a horse if you mount them. <laughs> They're huge, uh, they're really huge. And actually there were several occasions in the last two years, at least two or three occasions where ocean rowing boats were pierced by the, uh, by the pier of the, of the, the marlin or the uh, sailfish. Uh, so we could turn into souvlaki <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the ocean there because we had to jump off the boat and clean it uh, from barnacles underneath. So we were always looking around uh, for the for the sail for the uh, marlins, for the uh, sharks. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so once, yeah, as, my, as my father said, um, we had to scrape off um, some of the um, barnacles growing under the boat because they were slowing it down um, significantly. So I think that once we reach maybe the hotter section of, of our crossing, so maybe after the Canary Islands, probably around Cape Verde, that's where we started scraping the boat. Um, and I remember uh, I had like designed this, um, it's not really a coping mechanism, but maybe like uh, this proportion of time where, I, where when I jump into the, to the um, sea and start scraping the boat, I, I um, devote 80% of the time in the water to scraping the boat and 20% of the time to look around for sharks, right? Because I, I, I was pretty scared the first time, the first couple of times I had to jump in. Um, but after that, after I, I did that, I asked my dad, so what's your like percentage, right? So I, I look around 20% uh, of the time and straight 80. So what about you? And, and, and you said, oh, I think I look around 3% of the time. <laughs> yeah, he. He's maybe not as... Uh, He's our risk, he was our, our risk manager on the yeah, boat, uh, was, so yeah. uh, he was a cost keeper. Uh, it wasn't a situation where it was father, son, captain, Junga. where it was uh, literally uh, half the time he was the one responsible. Uh, half the time when I was asleep, he was uh, choosing the direction, he was looking at the maps and everything, taking whatever measures were necessary to, to keep the boat on track. And this way, I think he was actively, actively involved in uh, in managing the, the boat, yeah, not I, just uh, riding on it, yeah. I tried my best, as, um, because when he's asleep or in the cabin, I'm, I'm the person on deck, so I'm responsible for everything going around on the boat. And that responsibility is uh, something that I, I, uh, I, was, I was pretty proud of. I just wanted to show that, prove not only to him, but to myself that I was capable of doing this as a partner, not so much as uh, a person on deck, yes. Um, so, yeah, so uh, about the, uh, the, the barnacles, uh, that process actually in time, as I got used to jumping down and scraping and scraping, I actually got used to that and stopped being scared of any marlins or, or sharks because I thought that um, it's very rare for, for sharks or marlins to immediately attack something they see. Actually, they normally linger 
uh, around um, before they attack. So I thought that in the case of, of a shark, uh, my father's on deck and he's looking around, so um, he could, uh, he could uh, mess, uh, signal to me that uh, I'd get up. So I, th I think that I, I overcame that fear of sharks and big fish um, the more times I jumped in. Actually, at the end of the crossing, we didn't only jump in to scrape the boat. We just jumped in to just cool off and have fun in the water. Yeah, totally, uh, I guess, maybe, maybe irresponsible, but uh, it was very fun. It was very fun, yeah. Yeah. Have you had the chance to stop on an island or be on some kind of earth in between? Uh, we were not planning to originally, but our route was passing uh, through the Canary Islands. And um, since our autopilot mm -hmm. died in the very first uh, days, and we had water infiltrating five of the eight storage compartments under the deck, the boat was getting very heavy. We had to take out at least 100 liters of water every day. So we decided it was the wise thing to stop uh, in the Canaries and fix the boat, fix the leaks in the, in the autopilot. And that's what we did. Uh, we had a second chance to stop at uh, Cabo Verde uh, for the uh, solar panels, but we didn't want to because it was going to make uh, it extremely difficult because of the winds to go back on track. So we had to, to fix those solar panels on top of the cabin uh, dig out wires, uh, clean wires from the solar panel and attach it to the cables of the boat. Uh, and it worked uh, at the end of the day, so we didn't have to stop again. Yeah. Were you prepared to actually do this kind of maintenance on the boats? And were you preparing for those situations? So was it something ad hoc that you had to solve on the fly? It was completely ad hoc because you yeah. never know what's, what can go wrong. For example, a rudder. Uh, which helps navigate the boat in a particular direction, uh, broke uh, not once, not twice, uh, not three times, it broke six times. Mm -hmm. So every time we had to yeah. find pieces of metal from somewhere in our spare parts <laughs> or some, from some other place on the boat and attach it to the rudder, uh, bolt it together so that uh, it wouldn't break again and it did break again. Uh, so you couldn't plan for all of the, all of the mishaps. Uh, we had to use our creativity <laughs> somehow. Yeah. And each of those um, instances could have aborted the mission, you know. Each of those could have resulted us in us having to, to ask for, for rescue. Uh, so there was this constant, uh, first of all, in, initially, the, the fear of the unknown, right? We were completely in the unknown. And there was a, a, the fear for our life. Uh, and then there was the fear of failure. So we had to find ways of coping with uh, those fears. But uh, with experience, uh, well, you gain enough uh, confidence that you start pushing the fears uh, towards the back of your mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Which was the, the real fear for you? Was it for your life, yeah. for the lack of completion of the mission? Or? So, um, as, as he briefly mentioned, um, I'd say that there are probably three main fears that I had, that maybe we both had. Um, the first one being the fear of the unknown. So this was mainly the fear before the crossing, or as we begun our, our crossing. And uh, it was the fear of the unknown because I, I didn't know what to expect. Like I really wanted to see the ocean, but at the same time I was scared because I didn't know um, how big the waves are gonna be, how big the fish are gonna be. And, and that fear, uh, I guess you defeat by informing yourself. Like as uh, you inform yourself about how, how the storms act, how big they get, um, where, the, what, where the direction of the wind comes, where the waves come from. So once you like educate yourself a bit and understand more about the essence of the row, um, you actually overcome that fear of the unknown because you start, it's not unknown anymore, it's known. And then, and then you overcome it. Um, then the second fear that I had was the fear of my, for my life. Um, and that was very difficult to overcome, especially when the uh, storms and hurricanes came. Um, as well as when I was swimming in the water with the sharks at the beginning. And that, that fear you can only defeat with experience. So once you spend um, 20, 30, 40, 50 days at sea, then you overcome that fear because then you feel safe in the environment that you have been in. Because you, as, as my father said, you adapt. And once you adapt, you feel like this is home. So actually at the end of the trip, I, I felt at home on the boat because I understood how everything worked, how the waves behaved, how the boat behaved, oars, everything, or air, locks. And uh, once you get to know that, you overcome that fear for your life um, because you have the experience to back it. Um, and so the final fear, which is also um, something which uh, actually 
was difficult and uh, tor tormented me throughout the entire expedition was the fear of failure. Uh, as my father said, every time something, some essential um, tool broke on the boat or equipment, I was thre threatening our, our row in our ocean. It wasn't really threatening our lives, but it was threatening um, the crossing. And so um, every time that happened, I did have a glimpse of, of, of fear in, in my eyes when uh, about failure. And I thought that all this work, this year and a half of prep, and then maybe these 60, 70, 80 plus days of rowing would have gone to nothing if we failed. But the way I overcame that was actually through a friend of mine who said that, he told me actually uh, that instead of looking at this journey as a um, challenge, I should look at it as a blessing because not many people um, have the ability to do something like this, maybe financially speaking, maybe physically speaking. So I should be thankful for being able, being able to be there and do that instead of thinking I could fail. And so once I thought that that's the most important thing, to be thankful for what I have, um, I thought that even failing would be something great because I'm there and I've done this, yes. So that's how I overcame my fear of failure because I know how long I've gone, how, how far I've gone and how much effort I've put and that effort won't be for nothing because it stays with me as a person and, and I've grown so much from it, yeah. No, that, 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 that's really cool because in a sense you, maybe you, you have matured, maybe, yeah. <laughs> just maybe. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. And um, tell me uh, something else. Um, you said uh, the fear of uh, failure, we won't complete uh, our quest. Um, why were, we, were you doing this? Because they weren't like Marlboro logos all the way. Usually those boats travel with lots, or automated with lots of marketing behind them. Like, what was the purpose that was really the driving force behind this? Well, there were several things. Uh, I mentioned uh, to be together. Uh, this was one big thing. Another big uh, reason was uh, for, for Max really to put a lot of effort because mm -hmm. these days everything happens very quickly for the, for the youngsters, right? They want a bike, they get a bike. Uh, there's no bike in the store next door. They ship it to you the next day mm -hmm. with a delivery company. You want something, you download it on your phone immediately. So putting a long effort, uh, I think, is useful at a young age uh, uh, to get it to prepare it for the... Uh, later years when when you start working and when things don't happen from one day to the next from one month to the next uh, after six months you don't expect to be the boss of the company right you have to have a long protracted uh, uh, effort uh, to get somewhere where you want to go uh, and we didn't want this uh, this journey this expedition to be an end in itself to be something just for us we wanted uh, to have some sort of a positive impact so we had a um, uh, a, a campaign uh, that we supported, um, a campaign of the Bulgarian Ministry of Health, uh, which uh, aims at uh, uh, stimulating dialogue in society about organ donorship, uh, because thousands of people need organ donorship uh, for transplantation purposes uh, to survive if, if their heart is not working well, their liver or kidney is not working well, and there's no other cure. Uh, and in Bulgaria, uh, we have the, the, small, the lowest number of donors and transplantations per capita in the European Union. So we wanted to do something. We wanted to speak about this. Uh, we wanted to invite more people to talk to their um, uh, family and share their opinion uh, so that uh, their, their family would be ready uh, to make a decision uh, when they die and when there is an opportunity to do a transplant. You know, indeed, in the situation in Bulgaria is not great, but I guess this is kind of a, a globally you know, interesting topic to be discussed. Tell me a little bit more about if I am willing to become a donor, or even if I'm not interested to become such, but I'm interested to know a little bit more about it. What, do I'm, what is my action plan? What I need to do so I can really support your cause? Right. I mean, there is a need for, for organ donorship all over the world, right? Uh, and especially uh, in some countries, there are not enough donors. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the thing that you need to do is decide for yourself whether you want to be a donor after your death or not, and uh, share this with your family. Uh, this is true not only, not only in Bulgaria, but in most countries, because uh, after you die, uh, the doctors inform your immediate family uh, that there is an opportunity to do a, a transplantation and they have the final word to say yes or no. Uh, even in the countries where it's um, 
uh, opt-in system or opt-out system, whatever, there's always a, a decision at the end by the, by the relatives. And, and if they know about your desire, then uh, that can be a larger can chance your, your wish. of this operation uh, happening. Yeah. So really it's not about legal framework or size signatures? In Bulgaria specifically, no. Yeah. 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 In some it's countries you have opt-in registers, uh, in other mm -hmm. countries it's um, understood that you're a donor unless you declare while you're alive that you don't want to be a... Um, there are all those mm -hmm. options, but again the key to, to your question is just think about it if you haven't thought about it and uh, talk to your family. Yeah, just talk more about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's really cool. Uh, so, another question that pops to my mind is the following. You have done this, right? You've overcome all of those challenges. Were you really relieved afterwards and relaxed and kind of easy going? Or was it really you, you were tense because you are not around the ocean and you are now with humans <laughs> that ask, you have so many various asks out of you. I'd say that we adapted pretty quickly to be back on land. Uh, yeah. it, it didn't take much. Um, one interesting thing was actually the first day or like two days on land, we, we could barely walk and we just couldn't get up the stairs because the muscles that you, you use to walk and balance actually just, uh, um, we, we hadn't trained on the boat much because mm -hmm. there's not many places where you can walk so uh, that was very interesting we actually wobbled around and and started climbing the stairs with our with our hands uh, with our arms instead of our, uh, our legs and uh, but other than that I think that um, getting used to the food and s a nice comfortable bed and nice showers was very easy yeah um, I think that we did mi at least I could I could talk about myself I didn't miss the um, yeah, I guess the freedom that you have in the ocean. Um, there's not the responsibilities that you have are simply about um, the team and your safety. So they're they're not they're, they're stressful, but in a different type of way, not in a so much social type of way. Uh, so getting used to maybe that social aspect was a bit more difficult. Um, but uh, communicating with people because we hadn't really communicated with them on the boat yeah, that, that was very interesting actually talking to my friends physically because I had only talked to them for three months on the phone and actually being able to see them but I think that mostly was mostly positives coming back from from the ocean um, I, I did uh, yeah again I did, I did miss it a lot um, but I was happy to be back on land yeah you, you mentioned relief. I wouldn't say I, I was sensing relief. I was sensing satisfaction, which comes from a very, very long effort, uh, as opposed to pleasure, which comes basic, basically for maybe having something nice to eat or watching a nice movie. And, I, and to me, life is supposed to be a good balance between pleasure and satisfaction. So the satisfaction come after, comes after a, a humongous effort, whatever it is, at work or some other challenge. Uh, but. Um, I feel that if I don't have a big challenge work-wise or maybe something new, uh, life is not so interesting. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So what lessons you've learned on the sea that you, you see being able to apply on Earth? Yeah, I think that something that immediately hit me was to appreciate everything and uh, the small things especially. So for example, of course, the food and then like a nice comfortable bed. Actually, our bed on the boat was just a, a camping mat, which was like three centimeters thick. And under it was rock solid um, plexi fiberglass. fiberglass, fiberglass. Yeah, and it was pretty, pretty rough uh, to be in the, in the cabin. But I think that one, one thing that I hadn't thought about was actually being thankful for having land and, and being able to walk on land because on, at the sea, constantly rocking, you get seasick, you vomit, and it's very unpleasant at the beginning especially. So I think that appreciating having even, even the floor and, and, and everything around you is something that I thought of So all, all the time on the boat. So when I came back, um, yeah, I was very appreciative of everything that was given to me, uh, the, especially the small stuff, not so much the big stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing, sorry, yeah. another thing that, that, that I thought about was actually during the row, um, motivation-wise, I actually realized that you have external, I mean, I call it external internal motivation. So maybe an external motivator could be, for example, as I row thinking, if I complete this, I'll become the youngest ocean rower. 
or if I complete this, I'll be on the news. And this is it's it's um, exciting, but it's it's very quick. It's not very strong. So so when you're on the boat and you're 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 completely tortured and and you continue you have to continue on rowing in the dark and you're and you're wet and cold. And I, I'd say that those external motivators they are useless. Uh, at least to me, I, they cannot motivate me. Um, then then come the internal motivators, which are my curiosity for the ocean. Um, me wanting to prove to myself that I'm able to do this. So these motivators actually were the things that carried me throughout. Um, and, and I realized how, how little um, the actual record meant to me on the boat and how I was not doing it for, for that. And I'm very happy that that wasn't my motivator because the real reason that I wanted to do this thing was of course to be with my father and be able to, to do something like this and prove to myself that I, I was capable of something like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think every person has external motivators, but in the end, the essential thing under, under your, uh, I guess, skin, in your soul, are the internal motivators which actually push on um, and, and make you overcome your biggest challenges, maybe in work, maybe in the family, um, and, and in life, I think. Yeah. The, in my thought process, there are actually three people I'm speaking here today, and the third missing one, which is not with us, is um, another hero sitting at home. Tell me a little bit about the, the thoughts. Uh, uh, and his mom. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> a, 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 a loving mother and the wife that most likely have uh, went through her own uh, hurricane and storms. Tell me a little bit more about um, what happened with her and how he felt around during your absence. That is the interesting. Well, thing. she's the most caring person, right? And also, uh, she is very, very sensitive to risk uh, and danger. So, uh, for her, it was really uh, an overwhelmingly scary experience. Uh, she was following the dot on the map every six hours uh, where we are and when sometimes the dot goes back or goes in a direction where it's not supposed mm -hmm. to, do, to go she realizes there's something wrong happening um, before we left uh, she wasn't sure she she uh, was going to let us go right uh, she wasn't sure we were ready so she was questioning us uh, mm -hmm. uh, the whole time she came up with all sorts of uh, uh, ideas about how to mitigate risks uh, she was the one that uh, uh, stimulated us to get in touch with our navigators so that we can have uh, them guide us through the winds and the waves and the currents. Uh, and uh, when she saw that we put a lot of effort and a lot of thought and we had first way out, second way out, third way out, out of most situations that could conceivably happen to us, then at the end basically she, uh, she let us let yeah. us go for for the uh, expedition and she supported us all the way through. She was uh, talking to us on the phone almost every day and um, when the navigator uh, team was uh, suggesting that we ask for help, she was explaining to us how maybe this is a, the more difficult decision than the decision to go on. And she was uh, with, there with us virtually the whole time. Uh, so we are happy to have uh, such a mom and such a wife. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is the real present that she gave you, really, the, <laughs> the opportunity to sail. And I'll say that yeah. all trips and experiences and vacations, they come to an end. But what doesn't come to an end is the family, right? Uh, being around the family, this stays until you're, you're alive, right? Yeah, uh, that is um, a great accomplishment. We have lots of people asking you, what's the next challenge? What's next? <laughs> yes, well, I think that um, for the next challenges, we're going our separate ways, maybe. Um, so I have thought of this new challenge. I think, I think that Maybe challenge isn't the best word to describe it. I think adventure is maybe a little bit better. Um, so this road to me, it symbolized me overcoming this um, isolation, uh, just the two, both of us completely separated from the outer world. And I really liked that, but I just wanted to try something completely opposite to that. And so I um, have contacted a classmate of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, Ryan Welsh, um, who was actually also the person who advised me um, very uh, wisely on the boat that I should appreciate um, the row instead of, yes. He was, he was that, that person, he's very wise. And so I think the both of us were planning on crossing uh, Japan uh, from the northmost point to the southmost point with bicycles, um, biking around 100 kilometers a day. Um, and it's, it's not so much 
as physically demanding maybe as this. It's probably not as scary as this. Um, and yeah, definitely not as dangerous as this. However, it's not the point. And the point is for me to connect with a culture that I'm very interested in, a Japanese culture, connect with people, talk to them, communicate. And that's my goal there. I just want to be able to talk to as many people and learn more about their culture uh, through that expedition. Yeah. Yeah. And for you? I have a bit of a project uh, that our coach, our rowing coach, Victoria Dimitrova, came up with. Uh, she's a rowing champion, a world, world rowing champion. And uh, she suggested that the two of us uh, uh, make a mixed double uh, sculling, uh, in sculling and uh, prepare to participate in the World uh, Master Rowing Regattas, the World Championships for, for veterans, for masters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've never been to even a national competition in rowing, <laughs> but we're preparing for the world competition. So this is a huge challenge because from an endurance rower, I now need to become a, you know, a competitive rower over one kilometer distance, yes. which takes uh, three, Not 8, kilometers. <laughs> three to four <laughs> minutes. But yeah. you can imagine you are really using your maximum uh, it's effort very during those three, four minutes. Uh, mm. And it's very competitive. We'll be competing against people who have rolled for 10, 20, 30, 40 years or more, right? So it's, it's very, it's very tough. His, his, his training sessions are extremely straining. And I have, because I trained with him and uh, for, I guess, um, I, I've trained uh, with your regime and it's very tough. Uh, Vicky, again, the trainer who, who actually trained us for the expedition, uh, she was the one who's preparing. She's the one who's, as you said, with you and uh, uh, rowing with you. So I think that she really appreciates us and really, we really appreciate her um, uh, as a coach. Uh, but yeah, your, your training sessions are very tough. Uh, so it's, it's a very big challenge as well. Yeah, and how this balance for you as a father goes in between doing those adventurous things, being the good loving father, having your job and uh, everything that goes with, uh, with that, how do you achieve this balance because it's lots of work in so many different directions. Well, I mean, if you take the usual daily routine, you don't speak very much with your children, really, because they're at school all day, you're at work, uh, then maybe have a quick dinner together, and then that's it. Uh, so unless you jump off the tracks and do something outside mm -hmm. the usual, you don't have the opportunity to, to really get to know your most immediate family. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I, I purposefully try to, to spend time uh, with, with my daughter, with my son, with my wife. Uh, yeah. and just have a balance. You know, the ideal balance for me is 50-50. You know, 50% of your time when you're not sleeping or eating, whatever, working. And the other 50% is uh, having time for your family, for, for well-being, really. And it's hard balance to achieve. Uh, these days, everybody seems to be overworked and, <laughs> and having huge and increasing challenges. Uh, and this is another challenge, how to, to, to dedicate the time uh, to, to your lo loved ones, because this is priceless, right? Yeah, yeah. And Maxi, what, what about your schoolmates? I mean, I'm pr pretty certain they were scared, excited, lots of mixed feelings, but how do they appreciate you after your return? And <laughs> what they say to you? Yeah. Uh, are they really proud or maybe uh, yeah. they envy? <laughs> yes, well, I'd say that they were, yeah, they were extremely nice, extremely, I guess, proud of me. And I was very thankful. Actually, when I came to school, my first day of school, the entire school actually um, welcomed me um, in, in, our, in our basketball stadium. Uh, all, I think, maybe like 600 or 800 members of our school welcomed me. And that was, that was ama an amazing feeling. And I felt very welcomed, very loved by, m by my schoolmates. Um, for my close friends at school, they, they said, oh, Max, you haven't changed much. They may be kidding, um, but uh, I think that personality-wise, I'm the same. But I had grown a lot in terms of maybe wisdom, um, in terms of maturity, I think. Yeah, they said that I may be uh, more stoic. Uh, more calm, um, and uh, they, they've just appreciated me a lot, and I appreciate them as well. Um, so I think that this row has let me love them more and them love me more, yeah. That's really nice. Tell me a little bit more about the book. You've published a book in Bulgarian. Yeah, there are so many things that happened in the preparation uh, during the row. Uh, we could not even possibly cover 10% of this in a conversation. So we thought, why don't we just pour our thoughts, our memories, why don't we just relive the experience? 
Uh, and when we were invited by a publisher in Bulgaria uh, to write a book, uh, we said, wow, we had not planned on writing a book, yeah. uh, but uh, this is another challenge. And <laughs> we sat down and Max wrote uh, one piece, I wrote another piece, and basically, we, we came up with Neverest, uh, which has the same name as the boat Neverest. Actually, Max came up with uh, this name Neverest. Uh, it was supposed to be a word of play, including the words never, rest, and Everest. In other words, never rest until you reach your Everest. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, how the book and the boats are called. Uh, but to us, it means uh, find the goal and basically keep going until you get there. So we, we undertook the project to write the book and, and we are very happy. We relived uh, through the experience uh, once again. You've mentioned that you also plan having an English version of it, right? Yes, it's written in Bulgarian and it's already translated in English. So very soon, in several days, maybe several weeks, uh, it would also be available as an e-book uh, on Amazon. So we'll be happy to share a link, uh, not only for the Bulgarian, but also for the English version of the book with you. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that would be really nice. It's a very light uh, thing to, to read, really. Uh, yeah. I've done a couple of chapters and what I can sense from it is, is that it's, it's, you're not explaining about the, the huge struggles and the great achievements or the uh, mindset that you have acquired. It's more about real small things that really pushed you forward and forward and forward and forward. So it's really... Uh, mm, a good a good read for me. Thank so you. Th thank you for putting <laughs> all the, that effort. <laughs> uh, and um, what would you change if you have to change now? If you have to repeat this trip, what would you do completely differently from what you've done before? No, we could have a much easier role. We could choose another season. We could choose another route, uh, which would be much much easier with following winds and no no storms. But mm. I wouldn't change that. Uh, I think uh, once you go through those hurdles, uh, you appreciate the experience more than if you have a very smooth sailing. Right? Uh, we could have uh, maybe have had some different equipment that wouldn't break. Um, um, there, there were a lot of things that potentially could make our lives easier, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily change them if I could go back to, to the beginning. Yeah, yeah that's, that's completely true. I agree that I think that the struggles and um, the fears that we faced, uh, I think that I wouldn't change those. Um, they helped us grow more. However, one thing that I would change would would be getting a larger electrical fan <laughs> because at one point, oh my God, at one point it got so warm and so hot in the cabin and outside. Actually, in the shade, it was around 38 degrees, but you, you couldn't really hide from the shade because if we put something over our heads as we rode, it would by the Ocean Rowing Society, it would technically be thought of as a sail, right? So as cheating. So we, we, couldn't, we couldn't put anything above our heads except maybe a hat and some sunscreen. So in the cabin, it got so hot and so humid. And I remember like we had this very, very tiny electrical fan. And what happened was you go in and you're so warm, you spread out like this and you hold the fan in your face and you just don't move. Because the moment you, the moment you get up and maybe like have to grab something, you're already drained, like just completely drowned in sweat. So I remember that that fan saved our lives. It actually almost broke down at one point from the corrosion, um, but it managed to survive the row. So I think that one thing would be a very powerful, strong waterproof fan. I'd get yeah. an ice machine if I could have an ice machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so let's finish our talk today with the following. If you are the ones to give a message to the people that are preparing, not for this particular kind of uh, challenge, but uh, have a challenge in front of them. They need to face it and they either lack the courage or the, or the preparation or the mental or physical strength. What is your greatest advice for people who would like to challenge themselves the way you did? Um, yeah, I would say first of all, speak to, to, to others, yeah. right? Don't try to figure out on your own uh, how you're going to solve this and achieve this. Uh, what we did was we tried to reach out for the most experienced. Uh, we tried to reach out for the best, learn from the best, ask the best for, for help, for advice. Uh, and when you speak with people, what happens is that even without asking for help, just asking questions, people come and they try to support such a challenging mission, challenging project that you might have on your hands. If it's something very tiny, you're not going to get yourself, you're not going to get people excited. But if you figure out your next Everest, 
your next big project, whatever it is, writing a book or learning another language or uh, developing a huge new product for the market, whatever it is, if it's a big enough challenge, uh, people get excited uh, and then you get a big team working and then it happens. Then it doesn't stop uh, until you get uh, to the end, right? Yeah, I would say that um, at one moment, right before we set off, uh, I'd say a day before, uh, we had met up in Portimao, Portugal, with uh, Ralph Tuin, who's an ocean rower, uh, very decorated, has rowed the ocean ten, ten times, I mean all kinds of oceans ten times, and he said that, um, that we were prepared. He thinks that we were prepared, the boat was prepared to cross, and before that I wasn't too confident in myself. So I thought, if this legend and this, this, this huge like <laughs> person was, was confident that we were capable of doing this and believed in us, why shouldn't I believe in myself, right? So I think that one, one thing that I should do, and it's very important, is to inform yourself about the challenge that you're undertaking, being informed, being ready to take it on, but most of all believing in yourself. And that confidence is something which just lets you be able to overcome that challenge. And that, and that even, even I, I, I lacked at the very beginning. And I had another person, I guess, open my eyes and, and show me that I'm much more than I think I am. Yeah, yeah that, that's really powerful. It's been an honor having you in our studio today. Real pleasure knowing you. I would like thank to you. shake your hand. Thank you, yes. Thank you very yeah. much for having us. Thank you for those I, questions. We, we relived again yeah. <laughs> the yeah. experience in the yeah. ocean. Thank you.